Welcome, Journeys Crossing. Let's stand up and worship together this morning. All right. i 
time for the JC band. That's what's Woo! awesome. Well, I will that say this, good. the energy, Woo! this service is, yeah, doing People it. are awake now. Yes. yes. So my name is Mike Brown. Um, welcome today, whether you're in person uh, or online. We're super happy to have you. Special guest today, my beautiful wife, Demetria. She's stepping in. Hey, everybody. Host, got a little bit ill, so thank you for doing this today, babe. Yeah. Um, 
Cool. Uh, yes, our series. So we're closing today our series of the fingerprints of God. Um, we have a great closer. Dr. Downing is here with us. Um, he's going to be joined with our associate, Pastor Brooke, and they're going to spit some wisdom to us today. It's kind of mind blowing, in my opinion. Yes, and <laughs> yes, Dr. Downing is awesome. We saw him for a service. He is super smart. I could give all his accolades, but he's a, he has a PhD in nuclear chemistry. He was a researcher for NIST, and he, was, he is an independent consultant and chief scientist for Aware Ability Technologies. So I think he's qualified to speak on yeah. whatever he's going to speak on today. <laughs> yes. Which we got to sneak, we got to see if it's really good. It's good. So it's, yeah. um, I know this message was beneficial for us, um, my family watching at home today, but I'm, I'm sure it could be beneficial for somebody that you know. Um, one way that you know we try to get our word out is social media. Um, mm -hmm. Journeys Crossings has a Facebook page. Uh, they have a live thing. So if you want to pull your phone out real quick, just hit the share on the live feed um, and it'll reach somebody else that could use a message from today. Yes, and while you're doing that, also make sure to invite them to come back because we're starting a new series next week and it's gonna be diving into some questions. It's called Big Questions and we're gonna be addressing some questions that probably all of us have about God and the Bible. So, so. we're up here and we give you guys a lot of information. Um, sometimes it's, you know, for me kind of, I get in and out. Yeah, in and out real quick. <laughs> Uh, but you should have uh, received a program as you come in. The program just offers you uh, more things that we have going on at our church here at Journeys, uh, upcoming events. Um, yeah, so there's links in there. There's uh, QR codes. You can use those. They're very helpful. Yes, and normally I'm at the Welcome Center or welcoming you into the auditorium. So come to the Welcome Center at the end. Fill out your connection card. That's how you can get information. That's how we learn about you. Mm -hmm. You also see information about our next class, which gives you everything that you need to know about our church, what we stand for, what we're about. That's every Sunday at 1115 in the building, so. No doubt, it's very good. All right, yeah. before we uh, open up to the band, um, just wanna talk about our, sh share some of our offering that we did at Journey's Crossings. Um, last week was our Serve Saturday. Yeah, yes. clap it up for that. We had a... 150 participants to help over 2,600 people in our community. I mean, what a great, great day. Yeah. Yeah. It was awesome. Makes you feel good. Makes, makes you feel all right. And then the one thing that was, uh, it was overwhelming to me when I pulled up last week, uh, when we pulled up last week, was the amount of bikes for our yeah. bike drive. Like, I saw it and I was like, wow. Especially as a kid, I was walking by, like, looking, like, these are really nice, like a gold mongoose. I was like, I always <laughs> wanted one of those. But coming from our first world country and then sending these things to, to go West Africa for kids that are just struggling. I mean, imagine the faces. <sighs> you know what I mean? It'll be a... Yeah. Uh, Come on, babe. Damn. <laughs> it's a yeah. good thing, so yeah. keep it up. It's Thank good. you. So, um, yeah. That's it? Yeah, we're going to be praying band. for our offering, but I don't, yeah. Do you want to pray for the offering? I do want to pray for the offering. Let's you do can, that. but be, oh, there is a first. video. Are we watching the video first? Okay. All right. But there's also how you can serve and watch this video. Check out the video. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. Awesome. Yes. Very cool. So thank you to all those who came to help support um, our community, um, just given their time and resources. Thank you to those that give financially to our church, because without those resources, we couldn't do what we're doing. So thank you. Yes. And we want to continue that support. So um, we invite you to give to one of the ways that you see on the screen um, and just let you know that we give our time and we give of our financial resources to this church because we believe what they're doing. And it feels good. We were here for Surf Saturday, and that was just, it feels good to do something outside of yourself and know that it's going to be multiplied. So um, we want to continue that. So let's pray for our offering. And uh, yeah, let's do that. You got it. You want me to pray? Okay. Yeah, good job last time. <laughs> Lord, thank you so much for this time together. Thank you for bringing us all here for all the different reasons, whether we're new or whether we've been here. Um, we just ask that you would just do what you do and you know that each of us have our own individual needs and you know that you are the one that can reach those needs. We ask that we would be open to what you have for us today and that we would also open ourselves to be givers and to be cheerful givers. Um, thank you just for the opportunity to serve and to receive and we just ask that you bless our time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Oh, yeah. We've now come to our time of communion. Um, we do this to remember the sacrifice that Jesus has done for us on the cross. The bread reminds us of the body that was broken for us, and the juice reminds us of the blood that was shed for us. When you walked in, you were given a small container with bread and juice. Um, I'd like to ask you to hang on to them for now, get them ready. Um, we're gonna sing one more song and then we'll take communion together after. You're bigger than I thought 
So I stop all negotiations with the God of all creation. You're bigger than I thought you were. You're bigger than I thought. Oh, you're bigger than I thought you were. You're bigger. Go ahead and eat the bread and uh, remember the body that was broken for us. Go ahead and drink the juice and remember the blood that was shed for us. Let's pray. Father, the song that we sang uh, just talks about how you're bigger than what we could ever comprehend. And uh, this entire series, Lord, it just reminded us of, of your greatness, Lord, and the many evidence of your love for us. Father, you gave us Jesus. Thank you for forgiving our sins. 
And thank you for sacrificing your son to save us. In this world, Lord, that is uh, full of fear and worry, um, help us to be reminded that you are with us in this journey. Help us to, to lean on you. Help us to trust you. and Help us to rely on you. We need you, Lord, and we ask this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Go ahead and watch this video. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you all here today as we conclude our series, The Fingerprints of God. It's been so awesome to hear from a number of scientists um, and just explore more about creation and science. And we have a special guest with us today, Dr. Greg Downing. So let's give him a big, warm welcome. <laughs> I, I know you're going to enjoy what he has to share today. Um, he has a PhD in nuclear chemistry. You can see all of these things on the screen. He was a researcher at NIST, and you have a connection to Journey's Crossing, too. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. want to share that a little bit? I go back with Mark and Barb all the way back to Albany when they were involved in planning a church back there. And um, to short, I was down here at that time. And I joined a small company up in that area and went up there and uh, walked into their church, and I was shocked, you know, because here were these guys up on stage in shorts and playing guitars and stuff, and I was used to sitting in a pew. But, so it was a, a change in culture, but I talked to them afterwards and was very impressed with where their faith was, and I went to, was there with them as long as I lived in the Albany area. And then about, after, and that was about 10 years, and then I moved back down here. I was actually involved with the church plant, you know, over in, um, uh, I forget what the shopping center is. Over, over the there. Rio? Yeah, over at the Rio yeah. Center, over at the theater at the Rio Center. You know, so I was there and took pictures at the very first service there. So yeah, I go back and have lots of friends. I see familiar faces here. Yeah, well, welcome, welcome home. Thank you. <laughs> Good to have you here. Um, so let's just jump right in. Okay, let's jump right in. So okay. can you share a bit about where your interest in science began? Oh, my interest in science began before I even have a memory. My mom mm -hmm. tells me that I would disappear crawling and she would find me in the kitchen. I would drag out flour and sugar and salt and start mixing it in the middle of the floor. And she knew then you know, that I was either going to be a chef, which I'm not, or <laughs> become a chemist, and now I have a PhD in chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, it goes a long ways back. And from there, it just grew. You know, I played with, gosh, magnifying glasses and then microscopes and chemistry sets and electronic stuff. I tore things apart and occasionally put things back together. <laughs> not too often. Your yeah. mom was patient. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Built rockets and <laughs> dissected frogs and, you know, nice. did all kinds of yeah. things. You know, I began to, you know, pull um, uh, rocks, you know, collected rocks. And my mom wasn't very happy. I would, you know, sometimes store them underneath the bed. But <laughs> usually I had a shed outside that I, well, I put them in. And that worked great. I collected, you know, literally a hundred or more rocks, different types of rocks out there, and then a tornado came and blew it away. Oh. You know, I lived pretty close to Kansas. Mm -hmm. and, um, but 
I was fascinated in a couple other different ways too. Is I, I grew up, you know, during the, the beginning of the space age when uh, rocket ships were going to the moon and we first landed on the moon. So in 1969, if we look at the first slide, you know, perhaps, is that the first two men landed on the moon, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, and on July the 20th, almost 53 years ago now. And something that really struck me, they landed and sat down there, but the very first liquid and the very first food that was consumed on the moon was the communion. They had brought a communion set. And I thought that was really interesting, you know, to, to see that happen. And I was already interested in rocks, and there was an article in the paper that time that my parents read to me about there had been a meteorite fall, you know, somewhere in the area. And so I put together a kit from Radio Shack, I think, and started looking for meteorites out and across the farm that mm -hmm. I grew up on. And, um, found lots of things to set off my, my metal detector and took them into school, and I found out that they weren't meteorites. <laughs> and then I learned about glaciation and iron ore coming down from the Michigan area and things like that, but it still didn't deter me from uh, being interested in meteorites because yeah. my PhD thesis is on uh, meteorites. Yeah, and if you got a paper program, you might find a little meteorite that Greg came to you brought some, so you can have your own. So if you didn't get one, see if there's some programs on your way out, yeah? <laughs> yeah, or maybe your kids want one. You know, it's pretty cool, right? Yeah, it's a, a neat meteor, you know, find a fall that they found in, in Argentina, which was one of the largest falls at the time there. And I taught a online class during the COVID, you know, and, um, you know, I, kids needed a, a touchy feeling, so I packaged up a bunch of those, and these are the ones I had left over from that. And I thought, you know, it'd be nice to bring something out of this world since we're talking about, yeah. you know, things about science. Thanks for doing that. That's really, really great. I know all my daughters have been grabbing programs, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's talk about faith, too. So um, let's talk about your spiritual journey. Uh, can you tell us a bit about your faith in God and your spiritual journey? Sure. I mean, it goes back a long ways, too, you know, in the sense that, you know, I grew up in a Christian home. We didn't attend church, you know, every Sunday, but, mm -hmm. uh, but I went to vacation Bible school, mm -hmm. and I clearly remember laying across my parents' bed because they kept a, a red-letter King James Bible by their, you know, on the nightstand, and I remember reading through it and, you know, just trying to understand everything that was in there and all the things I had been learning in school compared to that. And it was really fascinating. But to take ownership with it, you know, I had to grow into it. And, you know, so I attended Sunday school, eventually ended up teaching Sunday school. You know, I eventually become, you know, a deacon, an elder, you know, was involved in Christian campus houses and establishing those. I've taught courses on science and, and uh, the Bible mm -hmm. in the past. So it's, it's been an interesting journey. That's amazing. That's great. And so um, in your years of studying science and um, your pursuit of God, what's one area of science that's fascinated you? What's something that has fascinated um, you? And, and how does that relate to your understanding of God? That's actually a difficult question because <laughs> I, as I tell people, I bore easy. And so I'm interested in so many different types of things. But if we look at this first slide, I chose just one, you know, to take a look at. And this is a picture I took a couple months ago. Actually, I was at a radio nuclear conference in Hawaii. You know, somebody's <laughs> got to, you know, take care of it. And, but when you look at this, I mean, probably the first thing you think of, you know, I, I, I see waves. And I'm fascinated with waves, always have been. And... When you look at this, you see ocean waves, yes. And if you're standing on the beach, you can hear the sound of the birds and the, the waves crashing the ground. Sound are waves. And you feel things, you know, the waves hitting the shoreline, bouncing, that vibrations, those are waves. But there's more to it than even that. The sun is sending waves of light towards us. We see it scattering off the atmosphere, the orange in the sunset. 
And if you look closely in this, you'll see a little green thing there just on the horizon. It may be a little bit difficult. And that's interesting because it is the sun diffracting over the horizon. And it's something called the green flash. So if a prism, like the rainbow, it's the last color that disappears as it goes over the horizon, if you see a color. So there's waves there. But there's even more waves there. Is the air there is filled with radio waves, which we can't see because we don't have any senses that pick that up unless you have a radio of some type. There are um, other types of waves. There's cosmic rays, you know, radioactivity in the water, in the air. You know, there's cosmic rays, which are, you know, very short-lived. Those waves are very, very small. And then there's really long waves, which somebody just received the Nobel Prize for detecting and measuring re about three years ago, called gravity waves. And, you know, we see short waves, but a gravity wave is about 300,000 miles in mm. the line. But all these waves travel at one speed, at the speed of light, you know, which is really kind of curious. So that's one. If you go to the next slide, we see that our senses are only attuned to see a very small part, the visible light, but the spectrum is huge. As I said, it goes from gravity waves, which are 300,000 miles you know, in the wavelength, but still traveling at the speed of light. And then there's really short waves, like cosmic rays, which are smaller than the smallest atom. And all that spectrum is huge. And to me, that kind of ties into to God, mm. you know, because he's bigger than just what we see, what we read in the Bible, and what we, you know, experience. I mean, he's much larger than that. And so we learn more and more about that all the time. If we go to the next slide, or next slide, please, we see in the Bible, it tells us that God is, is light. In fact, in 1 John 1.15, if on the next slide, it says that in him, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And like God, the speed of light, as far as we know, is constant. It's constant regardless of where we are in space, where we are in time. Nothing goes faster than the speed of light. And God is tells us that he is light. And, you know, to me, that's an interesting connection, that he's constant in our life. You know, God is love, God is light. So it's, it's a neat tie-in. It is a neat tie-in. It's, okay. it's yeah. very interesting to think about how we all experience each other. It's uh -huh. all based on waves, light waves. And I'll tie into one other aspect yeah. of it. On the next slide, we'll take the simplest element there is on the periodic you know, table or a table of the elements, rather, and it's the hydrogen atom. And what you see are 19 different images of the element hydrogen. And the only thing that separates them is how much energy they have in them. If we could take a picture, which we can't, of very fine, these are simulations, is that each one of them looks different. And if so, if we pass these out amongst everybody, and you could, if you have the ability to look at it, you would describe them differently because even though it's just an element of hydrogen, they look different because their wave, the energy in their waves is, is different. And so it tells us something about how we perceive something. It may be the same thing, but different viewpoints, depending on where the thing is, you know, can make a big difference. Yeah, how we, and how we relate to God is different, right? How we relate to God is different. Yes, yeah, um, and too often we want to separate science or faith, like they can't be together. Um, and Mark has been saying each week, like, we don't have to check our brain at the door, right, right, to have faith. And so how do you think people should approach the questions they have mm -hmm. about God and science? Sure, okay. Well, science is a big thing. It's like saying dog. You know, if I say dog, and you immediately think of an Irish wolfhound, right? Everybody thought of that, right? <laughs> but science is kind of like that, is that science is huge. It covers different aspects. And if you look at the first slide, people ask questions. You know, how does science relate to God, to faith? 
and I can't answer all these questions. You know, we've had four, four um, speakers in this, well, three speakers plus myself in this series, one of them about archaeology, which is a science, you know, which verifies, you know, the physical places that are described in the Bible. We had an astronomer from Montgomery College, you know, talked about the universe and how majestic that is, which we'll talk even a little bit more about here. And then we had a person talk about nanotechnology. You know, so they're looking at different aspects of this, you know, huge, you know, amount of space. And it's, so it's difficult to identify you know, for even scientists, we all see it slightly differently. So it's even more challenging, you know, for people on the outside. And just to illustrate it, this particular slide here is that there's a picture in the center there of a simple object. And depending on which side you were standing on it, you would see it differently. One person would see a square. One person would see a circle or maybe a sphere. Another person might see a triangle. But what the object actually is, is in the middle, and you have to have a slightly different perspective to understand it. And science kind of is doing that. All we're doing is putting together pieces of the puzzle so we can get a bigger picture of how God created, not necessarily even how he did it, but what he created, you know, what it's composed of, you know, how it's put together, what rules, you know, occupy it and the like. You know, so... It's confusing, absolutely, but it's really interesting, too, as a scientist. Yeah, and certainly, there are other scientists um, that you've encountered or that you've studied that uh, have been on this journey of studying science and faith together. So can you give us some examples of scientists who you have found um, uh, have alignment, found alignment between science and God? That's, a, again, a difficult not because it's hard to find any it's difficult because there's so many to choose from so i'm just going to go with things that are simple so if we look at the first one i'll go with someone from the home state that i grew up in in missouri this is a a guy who grew up started as a slave in missouri rose to missouri where i was you know, grew up at and he also got his degree in chemistry as well and he, but he was a very well-known, very well-respected agronomist. He was an artist. He was a scientist, an educator, and a humanitarian. And it, he, he just had a fascinating life to read the details you know, about you know, what he did and how he got to where he was. But it was always, even though he was a fantastically known as a scientist, he was also very well-known for his faith. Mm. And one of the, the quotes that I like was a student he was talking to a student about his belief in God. And he said, when I was young, I said to God, God, tell me the mystery of the universe. But God answered, the knowledge, that knowledge is for me above alone. So I said, God, tell me about the mystery of the peanut. And God said, well, George, that's more nearly your size. <laughs> <laughs> and so George went to work on, on Peanuts. And interestingly, he, the only book that he ever took into his laboratory that's, that anybody is, that I've ever seen or read about was the Bible. Mm. You know, that was the only book he took into his science laboratory was the Bible. And through that, he developed over 300 different products for Peanuts and over 200 different products for sweet potatoes. You know, so he, you know, God answered him and told him a little bit about peanuts. You know, like, but, <laughs> you know, today, you know, we take all kinds of books and things into our laboratory, but to think this gentleman, you know, this scientist, you know, very well respected, you know, just took his Bible in there. And the, the last thing there is that he tied it in to his faith because even though he taught at the university, he also taught a Bible class before classes started at the university. And, you know, he tied in and told them that, he, you know, about faith and the creation and science did not conflict. And that's what we're talking about today. So he makes a good example. There's, the next slide is someone that was the second Nobel Prize winner that I ever met when I was in graduate school. A very nice guy, extremely easy to talk to, very open, very smart, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, 
he, Dr. Towns, got the Nobel Prize for developing the laser, light amplification by stimulation of, of, of radiation. And, um, and he also for the, for the maser. But he's also known for his ability and his you know, strength in connecting you know, spiritual matters and God you know, to his work. You know, he's a founder of, an, of, of, of a foundation you know, to, for the dialogue between science and that. And he said, science wants to know the mechanism of the universe. Religion is the meaning. So you begin to get a, a taste of science is just looking about what God did, and religion is about why he did it, mm. going through it. If, if, if we go to, to the next slide, this is someone who's a little bit closer to, you know, to this area, is Francis Collins, who was, for many years was the director of the National Institute of, of Health, you know, just down in Bethesda. And uh, he recently retired and is now the science advisor to the president of the United States. Mm -hmm. And he was also the head of the Human Genome Project. And he lists, and I won't go through them all, but a number of about six or seven different uh, reasons that he sees that God is connected you know, to science. He's written some uh, New York Times bestsellers on the subject. You know, you can read about, you know, what he's written, but, you know, just very, very, you know, interesting sort of guy. And so these are just a few examples, but I think you have some, um, a slide for us that we'll talk a little bit about are the number of scientists who would claim to have faith in God lower than people of other education levels or careers. How's that? What's the relationship? It's a good question, and if you remember, I talked about it's how you look at it is, I forget who was it, um, there's a quote that I can't think of right now, I don't know whether it's Will Rogers or, or uh, Mark Twain said, you know, because this is talking about statistics, and it says you can get such wholesale amount of, uh, I forget what the term is, you know, misinformation by abusing statistics, mm -hmm. you know, I so poor. But if you look at the first slide, there was a survey taken, uh, what was it, you know, back in 2005, I guess it was, and they discovered that 76% of the doctors believe in God, 76% mm -hmm. of medical doctors. And 90% um, of the doctors in the United States attend religious services, at least occasionally, compared to about 81% of all adults. So there's actually, in this case, there's more, more adults, more doctors you know, in the pews than there are you know, just general population, which is kind of interesting. And 55% of the doctors say that religious beliefs influence how they practice as well, too, which is reassuring. But if we look at scientists more broadly and more, you know, what you would call basic scientists, it's a little bit less. You know, the survey published in Nature in 1997 and 1998 refers to a similar survey that was taken back in 1916. And there they found that 39% of all scientists, you know, declare a belief in God. So it isn't quite as high there. But, and then they said, if you read further in that, because they aren't very complementary towards the connection, that only 7% of leading scientists, I would take exception to that because who they call leading scientists are only members of the National Academy of Science. And that's a self-selecting group. They're very good scientists, I don't question that, but it's only a group that selects who gets into that group themselves going through it. And I can give you some, you know, many other examples where there are very bright scientists, you know, who belong, and there's many, many, many of us, actually. If you go to the next slide and we look at just the general population, there was surveys taken of and published in a, in a journal of, it's called the Journal of Intelligence, uh, for 137 nations. Mm -hmm. Along the bottom, going from, well, here, going from left to right, along the bottom, it goes from 100% belief in God to you know, about 90% belief in God. And then going vertically, 
is the intelligent quotient. And there's issues with intelligent quotients. I don't claim that it's the best measure of everything. But the title of the article was Average Intelligence Predicts Atheism Rates Across the General Population of 137 Nations. And here's where I encourage people to think critically. Because if you really look at the data, and this is the raw data that I took out and, and plotted so that you could see it, if you drop the first 17 on the right-hand side of this plot, and it leaves 120 nations, that 70% of those nations, the people in those nations, believe in God, 70%. And if you look within that group of people, those which have the highest intelligent quotients of any of them, you know, they have close to 80% that believe in God, mm. you know. So, and yes, you know, there are, you know, a few nations, you know, that are, are you know, declared and actually is politically unacceptable, you know, to, you know, believe in God. So it's kind of interesting. One more slide, you know, which I'll focus in a little bit tighter. This is a Nobel Prize winner who re resides right here in Montgomery County. You know, uh, Bill Phillips you know, worked at NIST where I worked at, you know, just down the road a couple exits and stuff. But he, brilliant guy, you know, got a Nobel Prize in physics for, for trapping atoms in, in beams of light and, uh, and its uses. And he says, my religious faith is not baseless or irrational, but neither is it scientific. I believe, uh, I believe in God as both creator and friend. That is, I believe God is personal and interacts with us. And he's gone on you know, to write extensive, extensively about it, has formed uh, societies where they discuss this dialogue and the like. And there is also, he gave a testimony of his faith I thought was really interesting. Um, here back in 2000 at the White House, they had something called Millennial evenings where they invited, you know, top uh, musicians and artists and poets and, you know, just a selection of, of very bright, very talented people. And they had Stephen Hawking come and do a presentation on science, what he believed, you know, science would look like in the next 100 years. And, and so he gave his presentation, which is excellent if you can find it as a YouTube and watch it. But at the end, because of the way Stephen Hawking communicates, it took him a while to compose answers to questions from the audience, or actually from around the world. And so they invited guests in the audience to answer some of the questions, of which Bill Phillips, this gentleman right here, was asked you know, to answer one of the questions. And the question was, why does life exist? And he, I thought he gave a great answer, and he talks about how you know, it's a very narrow region, you know, within the universe that we can even exist. But he said that either that's because if they didn't work out that way, we wouldn't be here, or two, as he personally believed, it's because God created it that way for us. Mm, so, yeah. it's very interesting. Yeah. And then, you know, the other quote that I'll, or, yeah, that he says that I'll, I'll read through here too that I thought was interesting. He says that it is highly unlikely, well, he says this is unlikely that God chooses not to leave clear fingerprints mm. for us. You know, so it fits in with the series. He's talking about how God is leaving fingerprints so that we yeah. can find them through science in our particular case. Yeah, and you even have a piece of artwork in your home Yes. There's a fingerprint, right? Absolutely. Yeah, why don't you show yeah. me this? Yeah. Um, this is a piece of art, as you said, that was given to me for Christmas here a couple of years ago that I have hanging in my dining, dining room. It's two feet by about 18 inches, you know, very large. And as you can see, it's a fingerprint. Mm -hmm. And it's called the fingerprint of God. And what it is is that it's, there was an artist who had just recently become a Christian and he was wondering how he was going to honor God, you know, with his art. And he noticed, and I don't remember exactly where he saw his fingerprint on a glass or on something. And he noticed that his particular fingerprint 
had 66 lines and whorls, those little lines that you see onto it. So what he did in this is he took 66 verses, one verse from each of the books in the Bible and, and wrote them that represents each of these lines. And so what this is is one verse from every book in the, in the, in the Bible, which I thought was really cool and fits this series, you know, perfectly. It does. It fits perfectly. And if we look, start to try to look for God's fingerprint, if we look at the next slide, I took the previous one and superimposed it. You can't see it very well, but it's that black, you know, oval in the bottom. But what you see there, this what looks like a, a network or a, a fiberish sort of thing, from where you're sitting, imagine yourself to back off from a higher viewpoint. Say you go about a billion light years higher than where you're sitting right now. It takes a while to get there. But <laughs> NASA has simulated what they believe from that perspective, what the universe would look like. And what's, what you're looking at is networks of galaxies, like the Milky Way you see in the sky at night. That's one galaxy. And this is an entire network of hundreds of billions of, of galaxies that form this network. And we see this pattern not only there, which one could argue is a fingerprint of God, but it continues down to things that are more tangible you know, to us here on Earth. You know, within our cloth, we see that. But in the tissue of our skin, or even down into the atoms, we see patterns that look like this. Yeah, we actually have a little quick video that we're gonna show you what this is like. Um, taken from The Power of Ten right. on YouTube. I've condensed it down, but go ahead and play that. So what you're going to see in the beginning is a, a, a hoop, one meter, and this video is going to begin to zoom out by a power of ten. So this circles ten meters across, and it's going to keep going out, and we're going to see first the expanse of the universe, right? Right. Yeah, and this is Italy. Yeah. Right, northern Italy yeah. is just a town on the coast. Mm -hmm. And you're just going higher and higher, higher. And higher. And when we get to a power of seven, um, then we'll see the we'll finally see the Earth as a whole. And at a power of eight, the Moon. So the Moon is quite a distance off. Galaxies, Galaxies right? These are more and more galaxies. And when we get out to this video, I think says 10 billion light years. Uh -huh. This is the farthest we can see. That's this is the God's arch. fingerprint right there. Yeah. And then we're going to zoom in and we're going to come back to Earth because, like Dr. Downing said, it gets small too, right? So we're going to look in a water droplet and see how small things get as well because we can go a power of 10 the other way. <laughs> yeah? So within a water droplet, um, you'll see many one-celled organisms. Yeah. Amoebas, yeah. paramecians, yeah, yeah. all sorts of creatures that we can see underneath a microscope, microscope yeah. that gets even smaller. It gets even smaller. So when we zoom in a little further, we're gonna go in and we're gonna see, when we get to the negative five, we'll see spiraling molecules of DNA, right? But within the DNA, that's made up of atoms. And so I think we're gonna zoom in on a carbon atom in this video yeah. we'll zoom in and see what's in there. There's a DNA. Yeah, DNA, there's the carbon atom, yeah. And when we get inside, um, then we see electrons. And neutrons. And neutrons bouncing around, negative 10, 10 to the negative 10 meters. Right. Can't even imagine how small that is. Um, and then as we get a little further, then we find the nucleus of the atom. Right. right? And it gets smaller, right? We can go inside and we can see quarks. Well, we can't really see them. Right. We think. We, right. We, but yeah. we know they're there. We, we can test for them. Yeah. Right. And there may be something even smaller. That's where we, as far as we know. That's right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. As far as we can measure, yeah. there's more beyond that yeah. in both directions, not only up, but in. Uh, up, so. Yeah, it's fascinating, right? So um, to think that we exist is yeah. pretty And incredible. a couple of weeks ago, um, Gladys Colbert talked a little bit about fine-tuning because the universe is so vast and so detailed, but it takes some constants of science, right, to make this work. Right. So can you talk a little more about this fine-tuning? Certainly. If you look at the next slide, is, you remember I mentioned that Bill Phillips had mentioned about the existence of life and how, you know, if it hadn't been made the way it was, that we wouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. Is that I 
think that theoretically there's a maximum of 25 constants, but it, normally they typically talk about six constants that are, are some of the prime constants, and that if any of those were tweaked just a little bit different than what they were, then not only would we not be here, but not even the atoms would be here. You know, that, that the laws of physics would be so perturbed that <laughs> it just, you know, nothing that we, can, that we see and take for granted would exist. You know, just because of these constants are what they are. And like, now, granted, there are scientists, just like there are people you find that um, believe differently. There are some that believe that some of these could be tweaked as much as 50%, but those are not the majority voice. The majority voice believe that just a few percent would, would make life untenable. So it's pretty amazing, you know, that we are, you know, yeah. sitting here. That we are here. Yeah. Um, so as you have, you know, just a, kind of a final question. Um, as a scientist, what are some Bible verses that you find noteworthy? Sure. Well, there are only 31,102 Bible verses, <laughs> you know, to choose from. <laughs> and, but I chose five to select for today. I mean, there's a lot over that. And I chose them specifically because, to me, they speak, you know, for science and, and what I am as a scientist. The first one says, wisdom comes from heaven, is first of all pure, mm -hmm. then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, mm -hmm. James 3.17. And in particular, as a scientist, the words that jump out at me are impartial and sincere. I mean, that's what we are called to be as people, but as scientists in particular, we're supposed to be impartial. We're supposed to be observers and just report what we see and be sincere mm -hmm. you know, in our response. And that if we're fortunate, they'll be pure, they'll be exact, like a constant. But you know, you know, as I've grown over the years, you know, science has changed. You know, and I've had to, if not unlearn, I've had to tweak those things that I have learned over the years because our knowledge has changed. Mm -hmm. If we were back in uh, Isaac Newton's days, well, then there would be classical mechanics, you know, the things of levers and heat and, and things. But when Einstein come along, he said, no, there's some more details to that. There's quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. and they affect even more, you know, aspects of it you know, at a smaller level, and we see how things work. The second one I chose was first that Thessalonians, you know, Paul's uh, letter to the Thessalonians saying, test everything, hold on to good. Mm -hmm. Is that not science? You know, test mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. And so, and then if we do it right, then we discard those things which aren't true. Mm -hmm. The f third one was the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Mm -hmm. And I, Actually, that goes to what I had said before about how, you know, our wisdom is constantly evolving. It's changing as we learn new things, as we develop, you know, new tools to look at bigger things and smaller things. And, you know, so it's, it's really interesting to see what God has out there. The fourth one is, by faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is what is seen was not made out of what is visible. So that kind of screams of the Big Bang, you know, is that it came from what might have been a very small, you know, thing. I mean, really small, maybe about the size, you know, I've read different, different sizes, maybe about everything in that, you know, backing off to a billion light years, you know, came out of something maybe the size of a BB or smaller than a pea you know, something like that, or maybe even smaller than that. In fact, you know, when I was talking about radio waves and, um, you know, all over the beach, over the water and things like that, that, the air is filled in cosmic rays and things like that, is that, you know, there, there's mass because energy is equal to mass, can pop out of, you know, out of vacuum and create that. 
you know, it's just a, a perturbation. I mean, it's really, I mean, mathematics support it, and, you know, it's observed, mm -hmm. you know, that it can exist. And then the fourth one is actually on the next slide, which I have a visual to go with it, or fifth one, brother. And it is a, a mural made of glass by Tiffany, the same guy who designed Tiffany lamps and that stuff. You know, so he's put this together. And this hangs in a, in a hall in Yale University. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the quote there says, through wisdom is a house built, and by understanding it is established. Mm -hmm. And by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Proverbs 24, 3 through 4. And so he represents art, science, religion, and music. You know, because our lives are, are much richer, much more broad than just science. You know, like the music we had up here on stage is, you know, a testament to God as well. And the art is a testament to God, as is science discovering, you know, the fingerprint of, of God. And if we go, look, go to the next slide and just zoom in on the center, is that what he focused on at the center of this mural is science and religion. He puts... You know, three angels there uh, on the next slide, please. And the three angels represent for uh, science is devotion, labor, truth. For religion, it's purity, faith, hope. Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, it just it shows, you know, the combination, the blending of all these things to the figure in the middle, which is light, love, and life, you know, and... God is light, God is love, and God, you know, gives us uh, life. You know, so I guess kind of, you know, to put it all together and things is I believe that science is very powerful at showing us what God has done, mm -hmm. you know, how he's created it, and there's no reason to be ashamed of it. And it brings us to the point where we have no excuse. We can't use science as an excuse for not believing in God. Mm -hmm. But only you can decide whether you're going to have faith and believe in him. You know, you know science, scientists are humans. They abuse it. You know, they, they misuse it. And religion is, is abused and misused at times too. But pure science, you know, is only going to show you what God has created and take away any stumbling blocks for not having faith, but it's up to you to decide whether they have faith or not. Yeah. So. Wow. Can we give him a thanks for coming here? Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. Yeah. It was fantastic. What a great way to end the series, right? Thank you. I really appreciate you. Um, yeah. You know, I hope this series has done a couple things. One, it has uh, answered some of your questions about science and faith and, and opened the door to understanding that the two things can have a conversation together, right? And also that this is a safe place to ask questions, right? Absolutely. Church isn't always, maybe in your experience, a safe place to ask questions, but here you can ask questions. And so that's why we're going to continue this kind of idea of questioning uh, in our next series, and just start to ask some questions we have about faith and about God and, and just the things that hang us up. So I know we all have them, and I know you all know people who have them, so invite them to come with you, yeah? Let's just keep talking, keep asking questions. All right, let's pray before the band sings. All right. God, thank you so much for uh, Dr. Greg Downing. Thank you that he was able to be here. Thank you for the way that you have gifted him and the knowledge you've given him. And thank you that we were able to be a part of learning more through, through him today. Thank you for this series. Thank you that it's okay to ask questions. And thank you for leaving your fingerprints all over this universe that you created. It's amazing to see how you work in the greatness, the bigness, <laughs> and in the small details. Uh, we love you so much. We're so thankful that a God who could create such amazing things loves each and every one of us personally, and that you created us all uh, on purpose and for a purpose. I love you, and we all do. Um, 
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. I'm going to let him do this part. <laughs> All right, cool. Wow. Thank you so much, guys. Dr. Downing Brook, very informational. Yeah, that's good. As so it closed down our uh, fingerprints of God. Um, you know, it just kind of amazes me uh, how the, the two fit together so well. You know, you grow up and you learn different things and you just make you question things. But I like that at the end, you know, if it's true science, it gives you true facts, you know, and, yeah. and that's important. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I enjoyed the series. I hope you all did too. And um, we just want to encourage you to get connected, like we said in the beginning, just connect with one another. We have small groups that are opening, summer small groups, so you can go on the website or you can text small groups to um, 301-880-1543 and uh, get connected with us. And don't forget your connection card on the way out. Stop by the Welcome Center and get your free gift. If you're new, try to act like you're new if you're not. <laughs> That's what I try to do and then, then I started volunteering, I got one, so yeah. Whatever it takes, baby. Uh, <laughs> all right, another way, a good way to you, uh, get a chance to get connected um, in your programs, it also tells you that we have a Sunday fun day. It's a barbecue right up my alley. I love barbecue. Um, you can sign up for sides, though. So we're going to have the food and the drinks all available. It's going to be great music. Um, and I'm down to bring the Texas baked Sign beans. up to bring sides. Good bring things. sides. Brooks had my beans before, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, we're going to leave you all with the band. If you will, stand up. And uh, look forward to next week with the big questions. Yes. Have a great rest of your weekend. Steals my voice. You understand me. You understand me. Come to me in the valley of unknowns. You understand me. You understand me. You understand me. You understand me, so I throw all my cares before you, my doubts and fears don't scare you, you're bigger than I thought you were, you're bigger than I thought, so I stop all negotiations with the God of all creation, you're big. understand me you understand me you understand me God you understand me so I throw all my cares before you my doubts and fears 
Series called Big Questions. We're gonna continue to dig deeper. All right.